If you compare beer with bratwurst, and cheese with wine, or even whiskey, with donuts, then we think you can pair all of these delicious drinks with murder, conspiracies, missing persons, and more. Drink with us as you feed your craving for true crime and creepy stories. Okay, welcome to Perfectly Paired With, where the only way I can handle my wife's non-stop talking about murder stories was having a drink to pair with it. And that's what we're going to bring to you. So, Katie. Yes? What are uh, we doing today? So, in preparation of this murderous tale, I told you to pick a beverage that is one of your favorites, that is familiar, that is a constant go-to for you. Yes. And um, you did tell me the uh, topic of conversation today, and it is one that strikes home and we are very familiar with. So I decided to go with a bourbon of choice. I am a big fan of bourbon. And the one that I went with today is called Weller Foolproof. Would you call it your favorite? It is definitely uh, in my top three, if not my favorite. Okay. Kind of depends on the day. A lot of times, whatever bourbon I'm drinking is my favorite. So, <laughs> Whatever true crime story I'm telling is usually my favorite. <laughs> exactly. So it works out. You understand. Um, so uh, I'll just... I'm not going to tell you the whole um, spiel they give on the good old Buffalo Trace website, but I'll give you just a tidbit of what to expect from this bourbon. I'm excited. It is a bourbon that uh, balances a rich mouth feel with robust, robust, ro- robust, robust <laughs> notes of vanilla and oak. Um. Yeah, so it is a sweeter bourbon, and I think you'll you'll find that as well. Um, it's not a kick you in the face and put hair on your chest type of bourbon. How um, does it compare to Crown Royal, which is my like brown lic- liquor of choice? Well, considering Crown Royal goes best with uh, Coca Cola, um, and because. You need to mask everything about the way that thing tastes. Don't talk trash about Crown. It is much better. (laughs) Uh, All right. Crown has its place, but uh, for me, it's not in a glass chilled over a piece of ice. Okay. So he's currently pouring the Weller into actual bourbon drinking glasses, which I would call a schnifter. But I don't know if that's accurate. These are called uh, Glen Karen. Glen Karen glass. I knew it. Ooh, I gave you a that's, fatty boy there. <laughs> that's a pour for a grown man. Yeah. Uh, this bourbon is also very hard to find. So you know, passing over a big pour like that Oof. means that the person passing it to you uh, really likes you. I'm good. And is willing to share. <laughs> it smells sweet. It does. It also, I feel like, is burning my nose hair, which it's, probably for bourbon drinkers is a positive, right? It's still a whiskey. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Michael Scott is appropriate, and I would ask, does anybody have any Splenda? <laughs> no, it's good. I feel like it is a mature... Just like a very mature beverage. <clears throat> it's like <laughs> burnt my <laughs> esophagus a little bit. <laughs> if you give it a few um, sips, you know, give it a little time to rest on your tongue, get your taste buds used to it. You probably taste some of the uh, vanilla notes and whatnot <laughs> in there. I'm by no means like an expert on mm. how to tell you like what things taste like. Um, I know... I could pick out a couple things, but there are people out there that just get crazy with it. And, you know, they're like, oh, it's nutmeg with a hint of uh, uh, valerian root, which, you know, you're just like, what 
the fuck are you talking about? No, I do but, think that you can taste vanilla. Yeah. And it's like a vanilla that kind of wants to punch you in the face. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a nice. But also caress your shoulder. Yeah. It's kind of. console you. It's a. Um, um, I don't hate it. What's the little candy uh, where it's sweet and sour? Sa- patch. Sour Patch. It's a it's Sour, a sour patch. patch kid. That's the way like good en- bourbons are. You feel pain, but you're enjoying it at the same time. It's not bad. Well, you <clears> should <throat> just drink more of it and you won't feel as much pain anymore. <laughs> um, okay, so. Headline for all alcoholic beverages. <laughs> <laughs> How to become an that alcoholic. Will, <laughs> that should be the tagline for our show. Just drink more and you won't hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's sweet. It's vanilla y. It's for a grown man and it is completely perfectly paired with murder. There we go. See? I love it. Okay. So, so what are we talking about? What murder well, are we are we the story addressing today? That I want to tell you today should feel probably almost as familiar as that bourbon glass that's in your hand. The horrific events of this true crime tale took place about six miles from where we were actually living at the time in a neighborhood where we actually looked at renting a home months before the incident I'm about to describe. In fact, if I'm recalling correctly, it took place in a neighborhood where you lived for a short time growing up. Yes. Uh, well, with those details, you must be talking about the Jessica Ridgeway murder. Correct. Uh, which started as a kidnapping. Um, Just a missing person. Yeah, oh, true. Right. But she was kidnapped. Um, Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll get there. Yeah, uh, I did live in the, the neighborhood that um, this all happened in. Um, it was called Countryside. And... Um, we actually lived, I think it was four or five houses down from where this kid lived at the time. Um, now, I'm probably 20 years older than the kid or 15, something like that. And by the kid, you mean uh, the victim or the the killer? The perpetrator. Yes, the, the perpetrator. And um, I... I actually do remember like just going through the neighborhood as a kid, you know, where it was safe and you could wander around aimlessly all day. And your mom was always just, Hey, check in at this time. And it was always, you know, when the sun's over here, cause we didn't have watches or anything. The good old 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or when the streetlights come on, you got to check in or be home for dinner. And, um, anyway, I, you know, Wandering the neighborhood, knowing the neighborhood very well, I I specifically remember this house. Um, there was nothing that stood out about it, but I know it was close. I think it was the same model as ours, different color, but I recognized it by you know the the stairs in front, similar to ours. And um, anyway, it was you know within four houses, so you kind of know all the houses that are right around you. Um, so yeah, when the story came out and I looked it up on uh, Google Maps, I was just like, oh jeez, that one is really close. And then we also find out this kid actually went to a private school for a year or two. I think he was it was like kindergarten or first grade for him um, uh, at the same time that my younger siblings went there. Um, I, I, I think I had graduated by then, but he's literally in like their last uh, yearbooks, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty crazy um, how close that was. And. It, the whole area, Totemul Park, um, the lake that's there, everything that was being searched was my stomping grounds for years. Um, so, yeah, hell. Yep. And just like the Weller Full Proof that keeps bringing you back for more, I literally had never been able to get the story out of my mind. I recommended it to my favorite crime podcast, hoping that they would cover it, and they never did. Which brings us to this moment, which was me actually trying to figure out what happened to this little girl. Because just as quickly as the story broke, it was wrapped up, concluded, and not a lot of information was given to the public. A public who, if they were like me, can vividly remember this like uneasy fear 
that just set in when the story broke and then just lingered for days while a community searched for a little girl and then searched for the perpetrator of the crimes I'm about to describe. This is the story of Jessica Ridgway, a giggly 10-year-old girl who loved cheerleading, who loved playing waitress, and the color purple. <clears throat> and the color purple. And according to her mom, could not wait to be a teenager. Unfortunately, Jessica would never even see her 11th birthday. In the mid-size Denver suburb of Westminster, Colorado, October 5th, 2012, would prove to be a fairly cold day for early October in our sunny state. I think the highs that day would only hit in the 40s. That Friday morning, Jessica Ridgway set out under an ominous gray sky to meet her friends at Chelsea Park before school. Okay, so Chelsea Park was about three blocks from Jessica's home. Once at Chelsea Park, her and her friends would walk another mile to Witt Elementary School, where Jessica attended as a fifth grade student. That morning, however, her friends would make that mile walk by themselves because Jessica would never arrive at Chelsea Park. Now, obviously, when Jessica doesn't arrive at school, the school is going to reach out and try to contact Jessica's mom. Her mom's name is Sarah. Sarah worked nights and actually was asleep when the school reached out. It was at 10 a.m. that Jessica's school left a voicemail informing Sarah that she never made it to school. According to Sarah Ridgway, she actually doesn't even hear the message until 4.30 p.m. that evening, at which point she does immediately call the Westminster Police Department to report Jessica as a missing person. An Amber Alert doesn't get issued until about five hours later after all the appropriate protocols are met in order to have that alert issued. Now, according to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, here are the protocols that must be met in order for an Amber Alert to be issued. Number one is the abducted child must be 17 years of age or younger, which obviously Jessica Ridgway was. The second thing that must be met, however, is that the abducted child must be proven to be in immediate danger of serious bodily harm or death. To me, that means that they had to verify that Jessica wasn't a runaway and that she just wasn't at a friend's house or another location and that she truly was in danger. The third protocol that must be met is that there must be enough descriptive information available to believe that a broadcast will assist in the recovery of the child. If all three of those protocols are met, then an activation can be requested by a local law enforcement agency. Despite the CBI not issuing an Amber Alert immediately, however, searches begin right away. Local police agents are going to search Jessica's home, as well as the school, Witt Elementary, where she should have arrived earlier that morning. Another focus for the search for Jessica was actually exploring open spaces in Westminster, Colorado, which to me might be a description that many listeners aren't familiar with. So do you mind, Jason, what would be an open space and why would it be an area of concern when a child goes missing? Sure. Um, I mean, I don't get out too much, so I don't know what other <laughs> states have. I, I imagine most states have open spaces, but I imagine it, it varies state to state depending on what your topography is like. Um, ours here in the front range, which is what we call everything in front of the mountains, uh, that's within, I don't know, 100 miles of it, 50 miles of it or something like that. Probably not 100, 50 miles of it and and all along. So we've got Denver um, Fort Collins, all uh, to, you know, Colorado Springs, all of these areas have open spaces, but they're basically just fields. 
uh, undeveloped roll, land. Undeveloped land, land, rolling fields. There's not really trees. I mean, some 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 of them have some trees, but it's not like you know when you go to the Midwest and there's just trees everywhere, forests and. But it's tall grass. It's just it's like tall grass. Shrubs. Yeah, shrubs. Uh, it it kind of just looks like wheat fields, really. Um, and just lots and lots of it in that area there, especially at that time, um, it, it's changed a lot since then. There's a lot of houses, uh, that have been developed there and our neighborhoods that have been developed there. But at that time there was nothing really over there. It was kind of, you know, you, you, you went up North from Denver, uh, uh, from the West there and it was Arvada and then it went up to Westminster and then it just kind of stopped there and there was an airport and he got to Broomfield. Uh, but from from Westminster at that point, which is where this neighborhood is, uh, and it's the north side of Westminster, the very end of it, you go west from there, and it's just fields mm-hmm. until you get to the mountains. And, and even south of there, it's just fields until you get to Golden. So undeveloped areas between develop subdivisions yeah. cities things like that yep yeah. and and that side of town there's just it's there's it's pretty developed but there's also like there's a lot of space between all the neighborhoods and so there's a lot of open space to cover for them to be looking through so when you say that you know they're looking through open spaces it wasn't a tiny area it was extensive a lot a lot so the night of October 5th Around 10.30, the CBI does issue an Amber Alert for Jessica Ridgeway, and that Amber Alert is broadcasted everywhere. I cannot imagine a household that did not know that Jessica Ridgeway had gone missing by midnight on October 5th. Yeah. But the first big break or any break at all that's going to take place in the Jessica Ridgeway disappearance doesn't happen until October 7th. And it's going to be a homeowner in the Rock Creek neighborhood, which is located in Superior, Colorado, who notices a bag outside of his home. Now, this neighborhood is about 6.4 miles from Jessica's neighborhood, but both of these neighborhoods are connected by a pretty traveled thoroughfare. Can you name that? Yeah. um, Highway 36. So Highway 36 or the Boulder Turnpike is one of our larger roadways yeah. that people travel. Yeah, you're basically getting from Boulder to Denver mm-hmm. with that with the, and a little I-25. But yeah, uh, 36 is everything between Boulder and Denver. So it's not unreasonable to think that this bag could have had a connection with Jessica Ridgeway. No, it's still kind of far from that neighborhood. But 6.4, when you put it in actual miles, it's not that far. Traveling it, it does feel like well, a little far away. Mm-hmm. So the way the homeowner described the bag is a little bit strange. He says his wife noticed the bag first shortly after midnight sitting on the sidewalk. They thought it was out of place, but not so out of place that they needed to address it until the next morning. Their neighborhood was full of kids, and he said it wasn't unlikely for a child to leave something discarded on the street. I could see that. I mean, if there was a bag in front of our house, we'd leave it there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Earlier that night, the wife left the home at around 6.45 p.m., and she did not recall seeing the bag at that time. This means that they believed the bag arrived in front of their house between about 7 p.m. October 6th and midnight on October 7th. Now, the next morning of the 7th, When the homeowner took a closer look, he realized it wasn't just an ordinary bag. It was actually a backpack. And he described the backpack as appearing to have been deliberately set on the sidewalk, not like it was haphazardly thrown from a car window. Now, the backpack had a keychain, and on this keychain was the name Jessica. And inside of the backpack was a water bottle with the name Jessica Ridgeway. I was just pointing to your drink so you don't forget to be drinking. I feel like there are so many times in the story where we're going to need to take a drink, so I'm saving it. Well, we have more. I've got a whole bottle here. (laughs) Oh, it goes down. So smooth. 
So I don't know about this homeowner, but he must have completely missed the Amber Alert and all of the like legitimately round the clock news coverage on the missing Jessica Ridgeway because his response to finding this backpack with a keychain with the name Jessica with a bottle with the name Jessica Ridgeway is to actually just get on to something that my source is called a town life serve, which huh. in my mind is like next door. Next door. Yeah. <laughs> and he just sends out a message and he's like, hey, found this backpack. Here are some like descriptive details. And immediately a well informed neighbor imparts upon him like the significance of this bag and is like, hey, you should probably call police. <laughs> Which also, he does. you're an idiot. Like, how do you not know this is happening? No, he had no idea. But he does call the police. And we've got our first piece of evidence. A backpack taken from Jessica Ridgeway a little less than six and a half miles from where she went missing. Mm. Now, on October 8th, something else is going to happen. And it's actually going to happen in Cody, Wyoming, which is a town of less than about... 10,000 people. Now, for those of you who are geographically challenged, Wyoming is the state directly north of Colorado. Now, in Cody, Wyoming, two young girls are going to be approached by a man. This man is driving a white van or a white SUV, which is basically just like a modern white van. And he's going to ask these two young girls if they want to see a puppy. And when the two young girls get close enough to his SUV, he's actually going to display a pistol to them and tell the 11-year-old girl to get into the front passenger seat, which she does. Now, thank goodness this 11-year-old girl is released sometime later, but investigators think there could possibly be a connection between this abduction and release and the possible abduction of Jessica Ridgeway. Hmm. Now, Cody, Wyoming is a legit seven hour, 20 minute drive. So it's not Cheyenne, Wyoming, which no, you all can get of us to in, in an hour. Colorado, especially the Front Range area, no. Oh, I could get to Cheyenne yeah. in an hour, hour and a half, depending on where I'm at, buy I, some fireworks. <laughs> yeah. And in the end, the FBI is going to announce that these two cases aren't linked. So, despite a possible connection, this lead goes dead. Now, so mm -hmm. literally seven hours later, yes, or seven hours away, mm -hmm. um, so many three hours later, later, three days later, another mm -hmm. kidnapping is happening. Yeah, and it's like how yeah. are Life these rule, happening don't all let the your time? Kids go anywhere, all the ever. time, like everywhere, there's kidnappings. This is where we could Google <sighs> statistics how many like kidnappings happen. Every minute, I'm sure it would make us depressed and our kids wouldn't be allowed to leave the house. Well, you don't let our kids leave the house a whole lot. Anyway. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Point in case, Jessica Ridgeway. So the cases aren't linked. And on October 9th, the family is going to hold a press conference and they're actually going to speak to the public for the first time. Sarah, Jessica's mom, is going to sit on camera surrounded by family and extended family. This is going to include Jessica's father, Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah didn't live in the state of Colorado. He actually had to drive in from Independence, Missouri. For the most part, during the press conference, Sarah is relatively composed. And what she tends to talk about is the last morning she saw Jessica. And here's what she says. According to Sarah, Jessica was very independent and wanted to be responsible for herself in the morning. This included having her own alarm clock, which that morning went off at 7.45 a.m. Sarah goes on to say that that morning, Jessica watched a little bit of TV. She ate a granola bar. She got dressed. She peeled an orange for a snack later that day. And then, according to Sarah, Jessica Ridgway is going to walk out that door. And that will be the last time Sarah sees her. Compared to this composed display, Jessica's father, Jeremiah, was much more emotional. He would have bursts of like 
crying. And he focused mostly on how devastating it was for him to get the news. Yeah, I remember um, watching this and thinking, what's wrong with this mom? Mm -hmm. Like, to how how is she, like, so together? Her daughter's missing, and, like, it's, the weight of the world's got to be on her. Like, it's she has to feel it's her fault because she's been sleeping all day. She didn't get the call until hours after it happened. Um, I, I remember thinking... This mom has something to do with it. A hundred percent. So obviously with any missing child, there are questions regarding the possibility that parents or even other family members could have had something to do with it. Just like you, I was super suspicious of Sarah Ridgway. It blew my mind that she would not hear a phone knowing that her kid was walking to school and then not actually get up and listen to the voicemail until 4.30 p.m., but according to Jessica's father, Jeremiah, who was approached by FBI agents, he did not believe, nor did any other member of their family, that Sarah Ridgway or any relative had anything to do with Jessica's disappearance. According to Jeremiah, I quote, I don't see how any parent could do something like that to their child, end quote. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what we think about everybody, but it happens. So, and I, I live with you and I'm married to you and <laughs> hear all these stories about these awful mm -hmm. people out there. And sometimes it includes parents. hundred percent. But on October 10th, the next day, the Westminster Police Department are going to officially declare that the family had nothing to do with her disappearance. So after the declaration by the Westminster Police Department, basically excluding Sarah Ridgway, her father, and any other family member, Nine News of Denver is actually going to air a report that's probably going to give a lot of hope to Jessica's family. They're going to say that a girl resembling Jessica was spotted in Maine, and the woman who reported the sighting is going to describe a blue station wagon with Colorado plates. Now, this vehicle was actually the source of many tips being given to the Westminster Police Department. And shortly afterward, a statewide alert is going to be issued in Maine for this specific vehicle. And what was it? The blue what? Station wagon. A blue station wagon. What are station so wagons? 1995. <laughs> but despite this possible sighting of Jessica Ridgway, almost all hope that Jessica is still alive is going to be extinguished. Because at about 7.30 p.m. that night, a body, and I'm putting body in quotation marks, is going to be discovered in the Patridge Park open space of Arvada, Colorado, which would be about roughly nine miles from where Jessica went missing. Now, I vividly remember sitting in our apartment when this news report came on, and my source communicated to me that the body was actually just a torso. And when researching this, I so so we're sitting there watching the news. Yes, and I get a text message. And you message get a text from, from my people, your your person, and they're and, like, "It's a torso." And they just say, "It's a torso." Yes, and knowing like that, I, I know would you're be watching upset. this. You're you are you're going to want to know this. And if you cut this out, I'm going to be really mad. I reached out to this individual when I was researching this case because it was so vivid in my mind that this body was actually a torso. And my source was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Of course. Well, if you didn't you delete your messages all the time, you would know or you would still have that and you could show us. However many years later. It's a torso. So in close proximity to the torso investigators are going to find a wooden cross. Immediately, police are going to release pictures of this wooden cross to the public, hoping that somebody somewhere recognizes it. 
one of the calls police are going to receive in connection to this wooden cross is going to come from a neighbor of Jessica Ridgeway. Mm -hmm. And they are going to say that they are pretty confident that somebody living in their neighborhood wears a wooden cross, just like the one that was reported as having been found next to the body. And this individual... Hold on. Before you reveal this individual's <laughs> name that this person thinks it uh -huh. is, how many people have you ever seen wearing a cross where you're like, I know this person wears a cross. How big is this wooden cross? I, I don't I don't even remember them releasing this information. I, this is why I wanted somebody somewhere to do this case because nothing made sense to me as to a girl goes missing, a torso is found, and then jump to in a couple days, a 911 call is made. And all of the details in the middle were never reported on. Yeah. Like I had no idea how like the conviction of this individual came to fruition. Yeah. I I don't remember seeing a wooden cross. I do remember going to high school with several <laughs> really sure. cool dudes you know what? who wore uh, crosses around their necks. All us cool dudes had the cross could around be their like, neck. And it could be anybody. I, but uh, this is this but, is this by this boy. time, what what year is this? Uh two thousand two thousand five. No. No. <laughs> That's goodness. Um, 2012. Uh, 2005 was like, you know, our years. Um, 2012. Okay. Yeah. Definitely ditched the cross necklace by them. I think we'll have to look back at pictures, but, but I also, but, ser but maybe that was the thing too. Nobody was wearing cross necklaces and this individual was like, this dude walks around this neighborhood wearing this thing all the time. But I also, and I think it's weird. Cause he's like, it's a little too big. And he's, you know, trying to fight off vampires. It's or a something. little out of date. I will concede. Like, I think crosses were the era of like the Backstreet Boys and I their white flowy shirts. We need to bring them back. But I think. I think it speaks to the entire community's desire to like find who did this. Yeah. That they were racking their brain. Like, who do I know wears a cross like that? Yeah, because this is just, we didn't touch on it before, but this is a somewhat affluent uh, community. It's mm -hmm. not it's not a place where bad things happen. Like, this rocked that community. It, oh, actually, 100%. it rocked the whole area. That's why we were so glued to the story at the time. Because it shouldn't happen. Right. There. Like, it's not that close to the city. Um, you don't hear of these things happening. And... Well, all the details were kind of odd, like we're hitting on here. I don't know. And this might be jumping to like forward 25 minutes. But then you have to ask yourself, was this cross necklace something that was like accidentally left behind? Oh. Or like most serial killers or individuals who have the potential of being a serial killer, did they intentionally leave it because they wanted yeah. to get caught? Or did I'm they think they were better... Just tons of questions. Yeah, and I'm even which we're gonna I'm have taking to... notes as you're telling me the story, and I, I want to see if we like touch on them as, uh, as, as we, we go, go. and towards the end, want to ask you about it if I'm, you know, coherent, not coherent Weller induced. To <laughs> actually, ask those. But questions. But we're about but... ready to take a drink of Weller because what is determined next is just incredibly unsettling. So this torso is going to be examined by a sexual. Wait, wait, wait. The name. Oh. Who the cross necklace Ugh. belonged to that this lady Austin saw. Austin Sig. So the FBI gets the name Austin Sig. Crazy. Early in the investigation Crazy. as being a possible owner of a cross necklace found with the torso, which at this point they haven't even concluded is Jessica Ridgway. They're just very confident as Jessica Ridgway. Don't take a drink yet. Because we got to listen to some details. I've been drinking this whole time. I know. <laughs> so the torso is going to be examined by a sexual assault nurse. And this nurse is going to determine the following things. One, whoever belongs to this body, if it's Jessica, was, quote, bruised, cut, and sexually assaulted, unquote. Oof. And this is when we take a drink of Willer. Yeah. Gross. And from not, the not the Weller. No, the Weller's delightful. From the torso, the police, CBI, and FBI are going to lift DNA. 
and they're going to get a match for this DNA. But the match isn't going to give them a name. It's going to lead them to another attempted abduction. Now for this, we have to go back in time to May 2012. So Monday, May 28th is actually going to be a beautiful Colorado day. For those runners out there, if you're going to see noon temperatures of 85 degrees Fahrenheit at the end of May, you are going to find an outdoor path and you're going to go running. Yeah, and that's, that's it's hot, actually. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Colorado winters can be awful. Yeah. So if you're going to hit 85 at the end of May, you're going to want to enjoy that beautiful day. And for one Westminster woman, she's going to take advantage. So on this afternoon, located just... Is she running around Kettner Lake? She is running around Kentner Lake, which is like this beautiful, it's like roughly a mile path around a lake. It's a beautiful path, too. I mean, there's cattails everywhere. It's nicely laid out. You it talk is. like you run. No, I talk like I live there. But Kent- I rode my bike around that a lot. Kentner Lake is just southeast of the neighborhood where Jessica went missing. And this 22-year-old woman's going to go jogging take advantage of the beautiful day when she is assaulted from behind with what she will describe is a chemical laced rag and the perpetrator is going to try to immobilize her and she is going to fight back and immediately the perpetrator is going to run away and she will call the police she provided the police with these details her assailant was white, about five feet eight inches tall. He had brown hair. He had an average build. He was wearing a blue cap, a black t-shirt, small rimmed glasses. In addition to that description. Like prescription glasses? hmm Did she have age in there? No. Hmm. No age. But she can give them something better, and that is DNA from beneath her finger tips oh she was fighting yes and this dna collected in may is going to match dna taken from the torso which many people believe is jessica ridgeway on october 12th dna will positively identify the torso as jessica ridgeway bringing an end to any hope the family has to bringing their child home according to the daily mail chief lee burke put it like this, quote, the search for Jessica became the mission of justice for Jessica, end quote. And to kind of summarize the investigative measures taken up till that point, FBI Special Agent Jim Yakur, Yakur, whether he's fancy. Yakur sounds good. Yakur says, quote, today. Sorry, Jim. (laughs) I like Yakur. To date, we've searched more than 500 homes, over 10,000 vehicles, and responded to more than 1,500 tips provided by the public, end quote. Mm. But as of October 16th, when a public memorial service is held for Jessica at Faith Bible Chapel in Arvada, they don't really have any suspects. Now, this memorial service opens with a slideshow of Jessica set to songs like Call Me Maybe, which is just so 2012. Yeah. And more than 2,000 people are going to attend. Oh, wow. And the case will just kind of sit for days. Jeez. But if you remember the cross necklace, there is movement in the background. I've got notes on the cross necklace. So on October 19th, two FBI agents are going to visit Austin Sig. They're going to take samples of his DNA, and they're going to fingerprint him. And I think it's these two actions that are going to sit in Austin's brain, leading to our next break in the case, which takes place on October 23rd. On October 23rd, the Westminster Police Department received a 911 call from Austin's mom, Mindy Sig. 
Now, the 911 call is a little over 15 minutes long and can get very, very, very tense. Mindy is the one who's going to start the call. At some point, she passes the phone to Austin. And then to end the call, Austin passes the phone back to his mom. But very directly at the beginning of the call, Mindy Sig tells our 911 operator, whose name is Molly, that her son, Austin, is responsible for the killing of 10-year-old Jessica Ridgway. And she communicates to the operator that the girl's remains are somewhere inside her home. What? I know. Now, my favorite part of the call, and just for a little bit of levity, Molly, our 911 operator, actually tells Mindy, quote, you're probably feeling pretty crappy right now, but you did the right thing, end quote, which I think is like the understatement of (laughs) like all 911 calls everywhere. All like, mothers, you probably don't feel good, but you're doing a good thing. All learning something awful about their child. It probably um, doesn't feel good. That's, that's the under, understatement right there. Hey, you probably feel pretty crappy. That's not great. Oh, you poor thing. But good job. Bless your soul. Thank it's you after, for calling. It's after that. Are we going to listen to the, yeah, the call? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we should. And we absolutely will listen to parts of the call, but it is a very like discombobulated chaotic call at times because you have to remember it is a mom and her son on the precipice of their entire life's changing and it gets a little confusing. So right after our lovely 911 operator Molly commends Mindy for what she's doing, Mindy is going to pass the phone to Austin Austin is going to tell Molly that he has zero interest in answering any questions until police are sent. But Molly, the ever-professional 911 operator, proceeds to ask questions anyway. And as a result of continuing to ask questions, Austin is going to reveal that the young girl's remains are in his crawl space. So sh- so Molly, Molly pretty much interrogates 100%. Austin. Despite him being like, I'm not answering your questions until police officers are sent. See, and... She gets a gold star. Yeah, we should have figured... What is Molly doing these days? Probably still is kicking she, ass, well, answering maybe, 911 maybe calls. she should have went into t- detective work. But she just keeps hounding him and, like, gets him to reveal and his mom to reveal, I think, crucial information. Wow. Good job, Molly. Good job, Molly, of the Westminster Police Department 911 Division. What is Molly doing these days? Kicking ass, I'm sure. So she's going to ask Austin if he knew Jessica before the date of the incident. And he's going to say that he had no idea who Jessica was prior to abducting her on October 5th. And then Molly's going to ask Austin whether he's enrolled in school. And Austin is going to tell her that he attends Arapahoe Community College. So an incredibly agitated, emotional mom is going to implore to Molly, our 911 operator, do you have to keep asking me questions? To which Molly, our gold star 911 operator, is going to non-verbally basically answer, yes, yes, I'm going to keep asking you questions. And as a result of asking these continued questions, Mindy is actually going to reveal some crucial information. For one, Mindy is going to reveal that Austin actually saw a counselor a few years previously for child pornography. And in speaking to Molly, our 911 operator, Mindy alludes to some conversation that she had with Austin where it was stated that perhaps this pornography could have led to. And then Mindy's voice is just going to trail off. What? Another poignant moment. So Austin is seeing a professional, Mm -hmm. probably by his mom's doing, Mm -hmm. because she found child pornography in her house. Yeah, and as a mom, I think she's trying to get her son the help she thinks he needs. Yeah, most 
most uh, men go to jail for any of that. I know, but he's house. he's a juvenile. True. But she's going to reveal this in the 911 conversation. Crazy. Which I think is pretty important. Yeah. Another poignant moment on the 911 call is when Molly asks Mindy, hey, what classes is Austin taking at college? And at this moment, Mindy chuckles and reveals, quote, to be a mortician, unquote. What? Clearly the irony is not lost. And I think this would be a good place where you can hear some of the 911 call. All right, let's hear it. But we have to find it. No, it's here. But do you want me to... And Mindy, do you have the same last name? Yeah. Okay. And what is your home phone number? I just have a cell phone. It's 303 756 Three oh three. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you guys did the right thing by calling. Okay. The officers are almost there. I I won't ask you any more questions. Thank you. Okay. But like I said, I just I just need to keep you on the phone so we can have you guys come to the door when I tell you. Sorry. Okay. And I'm gonna ask you just to keep me on the phone when I tell you to go to the front door. You and Austin go to the front door. The officers, you know, the officers are gonna be very, be very careful. And they're going to work with you to, to take care of you and to take care of Austin, but as well as their officer safety, okay? No, oh, I know. Can I, does, does your husband live there with you? It's my ex-husband. He lives in Parker. He lives in Parker? Okay. Is Austin still there with you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I won't let him out of my sight. Okay. Where are you guys at in the house? In my room. Okay. Has Austin been diagnosed with any mental health um, mental health issues? Does he see a counselor or take any medication? He saw a counselor um, years ago okay. for um, porn. Okay. And we were talking, and we think that might have led to, but I don't know. And what? I don't know. Okay. I can't breathe. Take some deep breaths for me. Do you want me to start you an ambulance? No. Are you sure? No, yeah, sure. Okay, what just happened? I opened the window. What's that? I just opened the window. Okay. I need air. Okay. Mindy, are you sure you don't need an ambulance? I'm, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Take, take some deep breaths for me, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you, you know, you, you understand that I am taking you seriously, correct? I would hope so, yes. Okay, well, I definitely, I definitely am taking you serious, okay? Like I explained, like I explained several times, we're going to, you know, I have officers on the way. They've been on the way since you called. Well, I'm still here with you. Okay. Mindy, oh, is, uh, is yeah. Austin a white male? Yes. Okay, what color shirt is he wearing? I don't know. What color is this? Gray? Gray, striped, light gray and dark gray, striped. Hold on. And hold on one second, okay? Do I have an officer on scene? Mindy, take a couple deep breaths for me, okay? Yeah. Is Austin still there with you? Yeah, I'm hugging him. Okay, you guys are hugging? <laughs> okay, you, you definitely did the right thing. You tell me when the officers get there. They're coming to your front door. Okay? I don't see them. I don't see you, them yet. You don't see them? No. And you're at the front door. Yeah. Okay, they're they're on their way, and like I said, they're playing closed Westminster officers. There's nobody here. <laughs> and Mindy, I want to say one more time, 10622 West 102 Avenue. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Are you still at the front door? Yeah. Okay. They're, they're walking up to your house. Okay. They, for their for their safety reasons, they park down the street and they're walking up. Okay, and like I said, they're going to be plain clothes. They're not FBI. Okay, they're Westminster police officers, and they're coming to help you. We're going to get this all sorted out. Okay? I don't see them. You what? I don't see them. You don't see them yet? No. Do you have a front porch light on or anything that I could make sure that they go to? Yeah. Your front porch yeah. light is on? Sorry, what, Austin? Okay. Are you still with Austin? Yeah. Okay. What is... I know. Are you, are you with the officers or what just... What no, they're not here. Okay. Is Austin still calm? Miss, how is his demeanor right now? I need to hurry up. I'm trying to get them to hurry, okay? Like I said, we, we're getting officers there as quickly as we can. Is Austin okay with you right now? Yeah, he's just getting really anxious, and so am I. Okay. They're coming up to the door? Yeah. Okay. Do you see do you see the plain clothes officers and their badges? Yeah, they're here. Okay, I'll let you go speak with them, okay? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Goodbye. What do you think of that nine one one call? I told you it was intense. It is intense. Take it um a, a glup. Oh, I gotta I gotta fill because I've actually been drinking mine. I just let it swirl around in my mouth. I just really want that Splenda. No, I don't even hate it. I just, it's just for, like, it's putting hair on my chest. No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. But that, it's intense, right? It is. Yeah, that was, um, I mean, we're parents. Oh, 100%. I can't and even imagine the choice she had to make. And I was telling you. To call you, and report or protect and hide. Yeah. And but, and when we listened to the whole thing, uh, which, you know, is a little long to add into this, but. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. You can. I, you know, told you, like, there has to be so much emotion going through this mom's head. You know, um, from can't imagine like she, she's in disbelief that her mm -hmm. son could actually do this. And there's got to be a part of her that's like, I'm gonna help you get away. Like, um, nobody knows it's you yet. And she made the choice to call. And you gotta wonder if. She's going back and forth on that, that that choice, like, I don't because she that. keeps saying like I would have they need the a hurry, yeah. they need a hurry, um, because what if in her mind she's just nope, I shouldn't have done this, I should have had, I, sh I should have helped him, I should have got him a ticket to Mexico, and or you know something, just like how could I have done this so it wasn't traceable. I think that's what I would be thinking oh, during 100%. that call. During that call, I, I I think obviously like we we think of ourselves as good human beings, and if Not somebody comes murders kids, somebody, like we're gonna you know help society. But when it comes to your own kid, things change. But I think that's why so much of this case like eludes individuals who were invested in it because I had no idea that Austin's DNA had been collected days before the nine one one call. And that probably prompted his actions and his mom's actions. Oh, they knew it yeah. was a ticking time clock until they matched his DNA to the DNA found on the torso. Now, and so she. Unless, let's just play devil's advocate here. Oh. If 
she got him into Mexico. Yeah, Dog the he, bounty hunter would come for him. <laughs> <laughs> or another country. He goes to Mexico, goes to another country from there. I mean, you could buy bus tickets. At least then you could buy bus c- tickets with cash. It, it, none of it had to be traceable. And then when cops come knocking on her door because one person gave his name as, yeah. I saw this person wearing a wooden... I mean, that was the only tie to him. He didn't to have him. to give his DNA. That was the only tie He didn't to have him. to give his fingerprints. True. He volunteered it. I think they... I think he thought the situation was manageable. And I think his mom was confronted with this, like air blast to her face that well, like the situation has 17. become completely he, he, non-controllable you just well, need I think to he turn came it over. to that conclusion because he's 17 and he's he's, he's like they've got my dna they've yeah. got my necklace they found her the body in my house but it, also it, we're gonna cover this i hope later but you know i have questions of like why did he leave the backpack why did he leave the cross necklace Well, we're going to put a pin in that, and we're just going to continue on with this murderous tale, and we'll see if your questions are answered. And I make zero promises. Gosh. So so obviously after the 911 call, Austin is taken into custody, and detectives are going to question him. And it is during this interrogation that Austin gives details about what happened between him and Jessica the morning of October 5th. So according to Austin, once he has Jessica in his car, he's going to zip tie her hands. And as they drive around, Jessica is just going to ask him questions. And he will admit that he lies to her, telling her that everything's going to be okay. Eventually, he's going to take Jessica back to his house And once they're up in his bedroom, according to Austin, he's going to just play her some Netflix. He recalls it being something like Family Guy or some other cartoon. Then Austin goes into describing a blankness to the detectives. He says he's just going to sit and stare. And I think we're not going to do it justice unless we hear it from Austin's own words. Absolutely blankness in my head. Having no thoughts, no nothing. And it just it terrified me. So if you missed it, Austin says that he experienced a blankness. He says, no thoughts, no nothing, and it terrified me. At that point in the interrogation, he then says that he asks Jessica to change into some shirt and some shorts that he owns, and then he instructs her to pack her clothes in her backpack. Now, this is where the video I watched gets a little weird. I'm pretty confident that the Westminster Police Department did not release an uncut video of his interrogation because after describing asking Jessica to change into his shorts and his shirt, There is no description of what he did to Jessica Ridgway. There's a flash on the video, and then the video resumes with him trying to explain to the detectives or the investigators why he did what he did. So at this point in the video, Austin actually goes on to describe reasons why he thinks he did what he did. And we're going to listen to his words. forensic scientists, all that stuff, it just, it comes with that morbid territory. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't faced by anything that was morbid that they could show me. And I, I don't know, from there I knew that, I don't know, I just... Also, let me ask you a question. Morbid things just stop facing me. So later in the interrogation, Austin admits that he never actually fully thought through what he intended to do on the morning of October 5th. But when he set out that cool, 
October morning, it was his intention to pick up, quote, any female, unquote, that he came across. Any female. But let's also remember that he attempted a 22-year-old jogger, and she kind of, like, kicked his ass. Well, he's 17. So he set his he's five eight, sights which on isn't, something a little low, I mean, like, five eight's like your average man. Um, yeah, but I'm not going to give I'm him credit for that. just a little taller that. than that, you know, just so you know. Not I know, but here. I'm not giving him but credit. He, he, but he he's 17. changed he's 17. what he, he was He doesn't have for. any man strength yet. He's got boy strength. Yeah, so he, he went after a little girl. Exactly, like he, and that's what he we're learned, gonna say. He, he learned uh, that he couldn't handle it. This woman's older. I can't do that. Yeah, but, but then, no, he clearly was said, outmanned by a twenty-two-year-old. Child pornography history or something. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe that's what he was looking for. At his age, I mean, everything that he could have been looking at that represent his age would be child yeah. pornography. So. But here's what I find interesting in terms of just like trying to understand the psychology of this perpetrator. So the investigator is going to jump in on Austin's description of that morning. And he's going to ask, quote, so you were for a better word. And I think he meant for a lack of a better word, hunting, end quote. In addition to this, the investigator is again going to clarify whether or not Austin knew Jessica prior to that morning. And Austin again is going to reiterate that he had never met Jessica before that morning and that she simply was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But using the word hunting, Austin will go on to say that he had been out, quote, hunting, unquote before that morning and he never got remotely close to actually doing anything and actually on previous previous attempts when he saw someone he said his heart would beat really really fast and he couldn't think straight and then to this description the investigator is going to ask Austin was it that feeling that was part of the thrill for you To which Austin is going to respond, quote, I've been trying to figure that out for a long time now, end quote. Well, if he is, I mean, yeah, it would have to be because if he's having his heart pump so hard that he can't even think straight, endorphins are popping off in Mm -hmm. his brain. There's different chemicals going off in his brain that aren't normal for him, and Sounds like this guy just like sits around and doesn't do much. I mean, he goes to college, but he still lives with his mom. Doesn't sound like he has a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. Um, This is probably the most emotion he feels when he attempts something like that. Of course, if anybody does, like nobody would do something like that and not feel a stupid amount of endorphins. Now, his brain is probably formed in a way that he's taking it as a good thing whereas normal people are like oh no that is my brain telling me i can't be doing that but i also think that if he had been out on several occasions and like his body like countered his desire to commit these crimes in terms of his like heart beating and his brain not thinking like, I don't think he was 100% sold on, like, this is the life for Austin Say I, I don't think so either. I think he, he shows so many signs of what we would think of a serial killer. Like, the way their mind works mm-hmm. and the lack of emotion. And he's he, not quite there. Like, he's almost there, but he still has humanity I, in him. I think he liked... The description hunting, because I think that's how he liked to view himself. And and here's a a thing, too. Like, we listen to him talk. He He sounds teeny tiny. Well, he he sounds teeny tiny, but he, to be able to even do this, what he did, and hold off as long as he did, um, he's a psychopath, obviously. Yeah. And psychopaths, they... 
they don't feel the same emotion that regular humans do. They almost feel no emotion. They don't, they don't have the same triggers to what we feel in our everyday life when we're talking with somebody and they say a joke and, and we have a response. They don't feel any of that. And I think he is a psychopath, obviously, to mm-hmm. be able to even do this. But maybe he's just kind of on that cusp of he still has this part in him that tells him I shouldn't be doing this. And maybe all psychopaths have that at the beginning. Maybe at he's the just beginning, an immature psychopath. Yeah, like, like he's Ted, young. Ted he doesn't Bundy, have the confidence like, or the experience. the same or... way that he did in his first oh. kill. Save and Ted Bundy. And he kept. Because he's you coming know, he at kept you. doing it. He was just like, ah, no, no, no. I, I, I love it. I don't feel anything. Every psychopath is probably that way. That's my imagination. Yeah. That, you know, it, that's the way it goes for them. I think he was on his way to becoming well, some sort of like, multi-killer. That was his desire. It didn't work out. He, also, he, he went after somebody else. Yep, done it a couple of times. Um, it's that wooden cross necklace. How big that thing was. <laughs> It'll be the end of him. So, at the end of his interrogation, he obviously is going to be charged with the crime. And according to the amended complaint, Austin was arrested on 19 counts, including murder in the first degree, second degree kidnapping, sexu- <laughs> sexual. Sexual. <laughs> Say that, that again. <clears throat> so, according to the amended complaint, Austin was arrested on 19 counts. Those counts will include murder in the first degree, second degree kidnapping, sexual assault on a child, robbery, and crime of violence. Now, this is where I'd like to give you a legal lesson from a layman. I'm the layman. I don't have a law degree, but I was incredibly confused by 19 counts. He murdered one person. How does that result in 19 counts? And so, isn't, isn't that way... Everything we see is kind of it's that like way. It's just like... 77 like counts. Three against. people were killed. Yeah. yeah 77 All right. Accounts. So I'm going to explain it to you. It's free of charge. Thank you. So the first count on Austin Sig is just murder in the first degree. And the description given on this amended complaint is limited to taking the life of Jessica. Now, the following three counts are also murder in the first degree But when you read the description, it adds an element to the crime that was committed, such as murder in the first degree plus robbery or murder in the first degree plus sexual assault. Gotcha. In addition to all of his egregious crimes against Jessica, Austin Sig was charged with attempted murder and attempted sexual assault for his assault on the jogger at Kettner Lake, whose name and any other identifying characteristics have never been released. Now, before the trial could commence, Austin Sig actually pled guilty, which, to be honest, I think the word is pleaded guilty, but I like to say pled. I think to, pled sounds better. It's not <laughs> correct. Look it up. It's pleaded guilty wow. to all of the counts in the indictment. And according to one source that I read, he did so against the advice of his counsel. So he's just going to come out and be like, no, I did it all. Yeah. I I can't imagine any counsel is going to be like, dude, no, no, go to trial. Like you, you might be able to get some of these off. He's we might 17. Be able to do a plea, plea deal. And he's going to be charged as an adult. And the state of Colorado has. The death penalty. So, and, well, we're, that's not gonna nobody be gets used. killed. That's um, fine. Yeah, no, one hundred percent though. That but, was probably a part of it. And, and you hear something like that. Now that I've heard that, I was he a psychopath? All I right. mean, he was psychopath Just, to a certain hold on. degree. I will get your opinion, but we need to listen to, end to right some away. testimony from the sentencing hearing. So, even though he's just going to plead guilty. The judge has to hear actual evidence of what he did. Mm. So I played you an interrogation video that was clearly cut to exclude the more gruesome details. But there is some testimony. So 
During his sentencing hearing, Detective Michael Lynch, who was the individual responsible for interviewing Mindy Sig, is going to tell the court what Mindy Sig reported to him as having been told to her by Austin. And this is the story that she told. So on the morning of the 5th, Austin grabs Jessica and he puts her into the back of his gold Jeep. So whether it's in the recording or not, you literally was like, how did he get her in the car? He grabs her and he forces her into the backseat of his car. At this point, Austin is going to bind Jessica with zip ties and he's just going to drive around for a while. After returning home and taking Jessica to his bedroom, he's going to remove her clothes. And then he is going to attempt to choke her with zip ties. Now to his mother, Austin is going to deny any sexual assault on Jessica. He's also going to deny torturing Jessica. But eventually... Austin is going to strangle Jessica to the point where he thinks she has passed. Now, at some point, Jessica's foot is going to twitch and he's going to panic because he's going to think that she's still alive. He then is going to take her body, according to the testimony of his mom, reporting this to the detective, and he's going to put her in a bathtub. And he's going to cover her body with scalding water. After this, Austin's going to be convinced that she is deceased. And he will commence dismembering her body with a saw that he finds in his garage. He then bagged up the pieces of the body and put some parts in his crawl space. We know that some parts, like the torso, he's going to disperse. He's going to put them in an open space. Now, the official cause of death for Jessica Ridgway was asphyxiation secondary to strangulation or suffocation. And asphyxiation is basically just a lack of oxygen. So I'm confident that by the time her foot twitched, she was dead. And that was was just those after tremors that yeah in the body so thank goodness she didn't have to drown because if she had there would have been like water in her lungs yeah excruciating hot water on her body at the same time yeah now austin is going to be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years for the crimes against jessica but he's also going to be sentenced to serve another 86 years consecutive. So afterwards, to that life sentence. Did he have any chance of parole? Well, so let's say he's granted parole after 40 years, which he's not going to be because he he's still awful. Have the extra he then has to serve 86 more years. So homeboy's not getting out of prison. Mm. Now, even after the resolution to the case, right? He's sentenced, it's all done. There are so many questions that remain as to what happened to Austin that would potentially lead him to committing these atrocious crimes. And there are some interesting aspects to his upbringing that might give us some clues as to why he did these things. Where do we get uh, these, this information of upbringing from? His mom, his dad... I think his mom's going to be very honest. We're going to talk about some things that happened between his father and the legal sphere that could be found in court records. He's got girlfriends who are going to like either speak for him or against him. I think there's an entire community of people who want to know why this happened to prevent it from happening. And whether or not we actually get answers, I think is left to be determined. So for one, his father was no stranger to law enforcement. Austin's dad had a criminal record that included things like driving under the influence of drugs, 
but also assault and battery charges and domestic violence charges. What kind of drugs was he driving under? I don't Any know. Idea? It's, it's Colorado, so it's probably Lollipop. prior to Lollipop. 2012 <laughs> marijuana. Yeah. But if he's in the home and there's some domestic violence against his mom, yeah. I don't know, that could confuse him. There's also the fact that at age 12, Austin's seeing a counselor for child pornography. And that suggests some sort of like questioning and sexual arousal that might lead to potential crimes. Another possible factor is the fact that Austin is going to drop out of high school, Stanley Lake High School, his junior year, and he's going to report that he was heavily bullied to the point where he had to drop out of high school. Now, eventually, Austin is going to obtain his GED. He's going to enroll in community college, and he's actually going to do really well. He's going to win competitions connected with his area of study. But perhaps it was enough bullying to maybe veer his life course. Yeah. You also have his fascination with forensics. I'm not talking like debate. I'm talking like crime scene investigation, mortuary science, and all things morbid. His mom literally would joke with her friends about his obsession with decomposition. And according to one of my resources, Austin and his mom, and this I just... I can't even explain. Would practice zip tying together. And in like certain contexts, maybe it's a good wait, thing. Wait, mother, son. <laughs> right. Practicing zip tying. That's what she said, according to a friend. No, no. She literally said she and her son would practice zip tying. Oh, she's the mother actually. Yes. Is. And on let's say. <laughs> Jeez Louise. I feel like there are YouTube videos where it's like, this is how you get out of a zip tie. Okay, let's practice that. What are they practicing? Zip tying others and considering that he zip tied Jessica and he tried to like yeah, I can't strangle imagine her with zip ties. Any world, I can't. Any and world I don't want to disparage some... her because she like called the cops and she did the right thing, but homegirl was practicing Look, zip tying with her son. It's hard enough for me de- to get you to practice a jujitsu move with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to plug in jujitsu. I love it. Um, 303 training center. <laughs> yes, go there if you're in the Westminster area. Um, I just... I, I can't. I can't imagine. It's, just, it's, just, it's hard enough for me to get you to actually even practice any of my things I learn or something I tried and try to replicate it. Like we do it every now and then, yes. but you you aren't fond we of do it. it. <laughs> but <laughs> this is totally different. I'd also zip like tying. Where are you going to use that in a regular world situation? That if anybody came up to me and was like, "Hey, could I just see which way incapacitates you the best?" I'd be like, "You know what? Let's call somebody. Let's." And what let's did he tell his mom? This. Like, mom, no, this is know. a new martial art. Like, if somebody comes up to know. me and uh, wants to kick my butt, I'm gonna whip There's out my nothing. zip ties. And I'm going to spin and latch their hand, latch the other one, and boom, they're on the ground. This is the fine line that I think people walk. That would be a martial art like cops would be using everywhere. It's not a thing. You and I are talking murder at like 10 o'clock at night. And you have to like figure out like, is this just some normal like query? Like, how does this work? Or is it something deeper? And I just think we all need to like tap into those senses where it's like, you know what? My son just wants to know too. <laughs> Look, if my very, yeah. very young, under, yeah. under eight year old mm, son, no. I'm not going to say his age, but it's a little bit of well. If he wants to I can't explain it. practice zip tying, I'm going to tell him no. Good. Okay. So Austin's first girlfriend who he actually met at Warehouse 180, which is a church in Arvada, Colorado, mm-hmm. would go on to say that she had no clue that Austin was capable of doing such horrific things, despite the fact that he owned swords and knives. 
Michigan also, is just like one piece of the puzzle. Are we just right? gonna glance past the name Warehouse 180 for a church? Doesn't I that sound know. like a club? It sounds like a, a club in New York. Warehouse yeah, 180. Yeah, in the 70s. Yeah, or, or 80s. Like I don't know. Late, I can see We're, it. There, like there turn your one. life 180. You're headed in one direction towards killing um, a 10 year old girl. <laughs> let's turn hey, that around. Let's turn that around to God. <laughs> all right. He does. He solves it all. So you know. But he has other girls who then go on to say, whether it's just to have something to say, but they will say the way he looked at them, the way he talked to them made them uncomfortable. Hmm. So perhaps Austin himself could explain best why he did what he did. When he first confessed his actions to his mother, he apparently began the conversation with this. He said... I am a monster. And maybe that's all we need to know. Jessica Ridgway was an innocent 10-year-old girl who was just trying to get to school, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, who met a monster. 